you know, I think there is this sense of um, ownership when we can when we can own and celebrate our stories. And food is such a natural way of sharing those stories um, and celebrating history and identity. Hello, hello, and welcome back to Seek the Joy podcast. Happy Seek the Joy Tuesday. I'm your host, Sydney Weiss, and I have to start off today's new episode by saying thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone who joined me on Saturday for our first ever Seek the Joy Summit. Truthfully, I'm still... um, I'm still coming down (laughs) from Saturday and I'm still trying to piece together my emotions. And I think what I'm really feeling is gratitude, gratitude and excitement and just thank thankfulness. I don't know. I, I just, I'm so blown away by the day and the speakers and the energy and everyone who was there watching and tuning in and in the chat and sending in their questions. It's, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just, I'm really grateful and I cannot thank you enough for coming and joining and for participating in our first ever summit. It's funny when I was putting this event together at the beginning of 2021, I had no idea how many people would come. In fact, I actually had no idea how this was going to be received if I'm being perfectly honest. And I told myself, you know what? It doesn't matter. You're having fun. You're excited. You're inviting incredible people. It's going to be what it's meant to be. And that was kind of my mantra throughout the last month of sharing about the summit. It's going to be what it's meant to be. But my God, it was meant to be so much more than I ever could have imagined. So thank you. I am just filled with so much gratitude and it was an incredible day. And so many of you have been reaching out and telling me you feel the exact same way, which is also blowing me away. So thank you. I I just cannot wait to do this again and share this with you again. But here's the thing. If you didn't register for the summit or you didn't register and you aren't on the list to catch the replay, that's okay. Send me an email, sydney at seekthejoypodcast.com. I'll get you on the replay list. I really want everyone to soak in this magic and wisdom of the day. I just, I am on like cloud nine. Is there something above cloud nine? Because that's totally... That's totally where I am right now. And also I shared on Saturday that we now have merch. We now have Seek the Joy merch. We've got a couple of t-shirt designs, a couple of mugs. So head over to the link in our show notes to check those out. I wore one of our shirts on Saturday and that was a lot of fun. And I'm just excited to share the merch and the summit and everything in between with you guys. And just thank you so much again. I'm, I'm really filled with so much gratitude. All right, let's dive in to today's new episode because honestly, it is one of my favorites so far in 2021. On the podcast today is Lindsay Gardner. She's an illustrator, artist, and author of the new book, Why We Cook, Women on Food, Identity, and Connection. Why We Cook really highlights the voices of women in the culinary world, their varied perspectives and experiences, and it's a beautiful celebration of where food meets feminism. Food has the power to connect us and bring us together, bring about greater empathy, compassion, and understanding. And in many ways, Lindsay's beautiful illustrations and writing serves to empower all women to reclaim their place in the kitchen. Lindsay and I sat down to chat all about the inspiration behind Why We Cook and her desire to share the perspectives and achievements of women in the culinary world that are often overlooked. We talk about the impact of COVID on the food and restaurant industry and what we can really learn from being in the kitchen. Lindsay gives us a beautiful behind the scenes look at the first interview she did for the book, the conversations that surprised her the most, and we dive into just some of the beautiful profiles in the book from Carla Hall, Gray Chapman, Celia Sack, to Gail Simmons. Plus, Lindsay shares the greatest lesson that she learned from writing the book, why cooking is often a form of storytelling. We talk about how her relationship to food has changed, her biggest dream, and so much more. I hope you're tuning in to this one on YouTube because I think I held up why we cook at least 12 times. It is so beautiful and it features Lindsay's watercolor and illustrations and it's just It is a beautiful book. I've read it cover to cover and I I just 
cannot wait for you all to check it out. But before we dive in to today's new episode, I want to share with you our sponsor, BetterHelp. Over the last year, we've been going through some challenging times, and I know that you've been feeling it too. And now more than ever, it's important that we have reliable resources that we can turn to. That's where BetterHelp comes in. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. And it's easy and free to change counselors if you don't think the person you're matched with is a good fit. This service is available for people worldwide too. BetterHelp offers a broad range of expertise in their counselor network, and you'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions too, which feels like a game changer. I really want you to be able to live a happier, more joyful, and ease-filled life, and I'm excited to share that as a listener of Seek the Joy podcast, you will get 10% off your first month by going to betterhelp.com slash seekthejoy. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash seekthejoy. The link will also be included in our show notes. All right, that's it. That's all I've got for today's new episode. Make sure to join the conversation on our social media channels, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. We are at Seek the Joy Podcast everywhere. Whether you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or Audible, make sure to hit subscribe or follow. And if you can, leave us a five-star rating and review. Ratings and reviews really help the show get seen by new people and it tells them what Seek the Joy Podcast is all about. So when you leave that review, take a screenshot, send it to sydney at seekthejoypodcast.com. I will send you a little something something to say thank you and it's always just such a wonderful way for us to connect outside of the show. Without further ado, here is my conversation with Lindsay Gardner. So looking forward to this conversation with you today. I've got your book, Why We Cook, next to me and anyone who's watching this on YouTube can see the beautiful color, which you did all of these illustrations, right? I did, yep. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, it's amazing. And I really want to dive, dive into it. How did this journey with why we cook begin? Where did the inspiration come from? How did you get started with this book? You know, um, when I think back to the the origins, uh, when I was starting to formulate the idea for the book in 2018, I think immediately back to uh, my own kitchen actually in Oakland and, uh, I was sort of thinking through a lot of questions at the time about balancing all the different facets of my life, my art career, my, um, I have two daughters, so uh, motherhood, working, um, all the domestic chores and cooking. And um, I, I just started thinking a lot about what cooking really meant to me in my life and why it felt so important. And also some of the parts of cooking that felt burdensome, um, so I was exploring all of those things. And then I started taking those questions into my studio uh, and exploring them in my art also. And I also tend to, when I'm sort of thinking through things like that in my art practice, I, I also uh, tend to extend those questions that I'm thinking about to my own community. So mm-hmm. I, I started having those um, conversations about similar topics with women in my own life um, who were thinking about similar issues and found that quickly those conversations um, about cooking and food started to sort of grow and blossom. And I realized that there was so much there to explore that I really wanted to pursue. Um, So then it sort of started to unfold into bigger conversations. And I reached out to um, all sorts of different women working professionally in the food world. Um, And through those conversations, I started to formulate the, basis for what eventually became why we cook. Mm. So it really stemmed from your own curiosity and your own exploration in the kitchen, because I know you talk about this in the book, but I mean, we spend a lot of time in the kitchen and there's a lot of connection and conversation that comes from being in that space. And I know the book includes recipes, profiles, essays, and more, and you feature over 112 women in the space from activists to restaurateurs to food writers, what was the experience like reaching out to these women 
and having these conversations. I mean, I do it on the podcast, but I'm, I'm <laughs> to write, to sit down and write a book and to have these conversations and translate those conversations into essays and beautiful illustrations. What was that experience like? Um, that's a great question. And I'm sure you can relate to it as well, obviously, but, um, I, you know, it was such a combination of, um, different kinds of conversations. Mm -hmm. I, it, it was a real mix of sort of, uh, in-person conversations in the Bay area and then straight up cold, cold calling people like Ruth Reichel and, mm -hmm. you know, asking her if she wanted to be part of it, um, or emailing people. And I think that, um, overall the whole research experience was just so hopeful and mm -hmm. warm and welcoming and every single person that I talked to even if they didn't directly end up being in the book itself um, you know introduced me to someone or um, was willing to help or was encouraging or excited about the conversation in general and um, I think that that you know, I think especially in the in the scope of the last five years, I mean, I started writing the book in 2018 and doing the research in earnest in early 2019. Mm -hmm. um, the political landscape at the time and some of the overall feelings that are actually addressed in multiple points in the book in different ways. Um, having these conversations and really connecting with women who are doing such inspiring work um, whether it's professionally or um, home cooks yeah. who are also represented in the book. Um, those were just very reassuring and connected conversations at a time that was, to be honest, pretty disturbing. Mm -hmm. So I felt very, um, very reassured and hopeful. And uh, yeah, it was really inspiring to be in those mm. conversations. Yeah, I know you talk about that definitely, I think, in the book, or at least in the beginning, in the introduction about the Me Too movement and 2017, 2018, when you started to explore the book. And really, I don't want to say it was the height of the Me Too movement, but I think it was when discussions and conversations and greater awareness was starting, starting to take shape in media and in the world. And women make up such a large portion of the culinary industry. And I mean, I was reflecting on it and preparing for our conversation. I don't know how often we were talking about women's experiences in the food industry throughout the Me Too conversation. And so I think mm -hmm. your ability to shine light on it and shine light on the impact and how it really, I think it inspired you, right? To really put this together. I think I think it's a really important aspect of this conversation and, and your, your journey with Why We Cook is shining a light on all of that. Thank you. Yes, it was. I mean, it was a huge part of what inspired me to sort of take my own questions from just what was circulating around in my own head to reach out to a broader group of people. Um, because as I started to look into these questions that I was asking myself, I realized how underrepresented women's voices were in food mm -hmm. media. And I realized all kinds of other disturbing statistics that um, follow along with that, like you know, I, I think there's, this is also in the introduction, but 49% of food industry jobs are held by women. Only 23.5% um, I think is the statistic um, of head chefs and head cooks mm -hmm. are women. And that number is even lower for women of color. Um, so, you know, once I started to sort of understand some of those, the actual statistics, I was, it, it just all started to fit together. And it was, um, it was extremely important to me to, to reach as broad of um, a group of women as possible to um, include in this conversation, because that's another big part of this conversation in food media is not just women, but women of color and um, many, many underrepresented voices um, in that landscape. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. And I'm glad that you brought that up because many women and those who identify as women, their perspectives, achievements, role in the culinary world is just what you said, it's underrepresented. And I, and you said this too, that home cooks were included in this book as well. And I failed to mention that when I was listing off all the people mm -hmm. you mentioned. And I think that's important too, because there's something about 
I think our understanding of what it means to be a chef or to be in the culinary world or to be a cook, I mean, just to experiment with food, I think it's underappreciated. And I was really reflecting on this for myself of, you know, thinking about all the times that I would be in the kitchen with my sisters or my parents and, um, or my extended family and just the way it brings us together. And we think about food, I think, as being a connector, but we don't think about the role of food, I think, in the broader world world and how there's such a beautiful creativity and perspective and understanding um, that can come if we were to just dive in, I think a little bit more. So I'm glad that you, you touched on that, that it's about really highlighting these perspectives and these achievements of women in the culinary world, I think in a way that we probably just haven't really done so before. I felt that that was a really important connection to make for myself also, yeah. and sort of um, in, you know, and I, I talk about this also in the book that um, it was part of that understanding of why I'm drawn to cooking and what it is that compels me about it. And it's exactly that. It's that mm -hmm. there are so many things that there are to discover through cooking, whether that's a connection with um, a different culture that you're not as familiar with or um, a, an actual person um, or part of your own heritage and history. I mean, there's so much that we can connect to through food. And I think that um, that. I was searching for that, to be mm -hmm. honest, and I wanted to know what other home cooks thought about those same ideas, and I wanted to know if other people think about that when they're cooking, um, because it does give it so much meaning, this thing that we do in our lives every day, multiple times a day. So yeah, um, yeah thank you for pointing that out. Yeah. All right. So I got to ask you this because you you talked about it a couple of times, the questions you were asking yourself, especially mm -hmm. towards the beginning of writing this book, what were some of those questions? And because I'm curious for anybody listening, if they're going to sound like questions they've been asking themselves too, if you don't mind sharing uh, just some of the questions you were asking yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see. So as I said before, I have two daughters at the time, they were uh, five and two years old now they're five and eight years old hmm. um and I remember talking to them about that when I started the book um so they've really been part of the journey but I was asking myself a lot of questions about sort of um my my husband and I have at the time he had a job that was um we had these very distinct gender gender roles which, which didn't feel like us necessarily. It didn't feel like a true reflection of our relationship. My job has always been a little bit more flexible because I, I'm an illustrator and an artist and a an author and I my work is flexible inherently and his job was not like that. And I think that um, when, when we had our kids, my relationship to cooking just naturally started to, to change, of course, mm -hmm. because we're, I'm providing for two human beings that need to be fed multiple times a day. <laughs> um, and I think that that was really at the heart of it for me was sort of like, well, how do I relate to that relationship? And what am I teaching my daughters about not just food and what food can do for our bodies as fuel, but also what does it mean? And, and what are the traditions that I'm passing down to them knowingly or unknowingly? And what happens when I don't wanna cook tonight and mm -hmm. I don't feel like it, but I still have to. Um, and what, what happens when I really need someone to take care of me through food? Um, all of these questions sort of circling around these bigger ideas of motherhood, um, womanhood, you know, being a working mom, um, balancing all of the pressures of day-to-day -day life um, and how that sort of filtered into uh, my relationship to cooking. Hmm. Yeah, I think those are really beautiful questions. And thank you for sharing because I think there's an inher inherent sort of gender norm, normativity, I don't know what the exact right phrase is, but that's inherent in cooking. And I think your book, I think, is a beautiful celebration of where food meets feminism. And mm -hmm. this idea that really struck me as I was reading the book was how it's really a reminder food can really be a reminder of how we're all connected. And you spend time too, at the beginning of the book, really reflecting, I think, on the last year and the impact of COVID on the food industry and the restaurant industry. And so I'm curious, you know, what can we learn from being in the kitchen and cooking and how does it connect to the last year with COVID? I know you spend some time reflecting on this and I would love for us to talk about it and for you to share because I think it's a really powerful um, reminder and message. 
Yeah, I mean, that is such a, it's such a big conversation. And I think that, um, you know, so I had done, let's see, most of the manuscript was finished by November of 2019. And then I went into editing. Um, but at the same time, I had been working on all of the sketches for the illustrations um, simultaneously so that when I, when it was time to do the final illustrations and all the paintings, it was actually right at the beginning of lockdown oh, wow. and in California. So my, my kids were suddenly home from school every day and I had a, a, all of the full color paintings to make for the book, mm -hmm. um, which actually through the pandemic was a real joy to have such a specific and, um, I don't know, focused project that I cared so much about to retreat yeah. to. It was, it was, when I think back to the timing of that and making the art for the book, I will always remember that as a very um, special and purposeful part of the process. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that like so many people in this moment, um, the pandemic really ripped the veil, so to speak, off of what we know and understand about how food is in the world and mm -hmm. how um, all of the people that help us have fresh food available, you know, frontline workers, who, who are the most vulnerable people that are at the, the front lines of making our food, harvesting our food, allowing for grocery stores to be open through yeah. all these moments. Um, I think all of these things about how food systems work is part of it. And then all, also how that shifted our relationship to cooking in, in the home. That all changed in the pandemic. And obviously we are all cooking at home more than we ever have. Even if you cooked at home a lot before, you're still cooking more than you ever have. This is a whole new level. This is a whole new level. <laughs> it's a whole Absolutely. new level. And I, yeah. And I even remember, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, we just, we had like a whole different strategy in our house for sourcing food. And we had, we had a small refrigerator in the basement that was an extra refrigerator. We started stocking our fridge up in a way that was just so different than any other way we'd ever related to food. And it felt simultaneously like, apocalyptic and also really privileged to be able to access the, that kind of food in that moment. Yeah. Um, I think all of these, all of these issues are things that I was aware of for myself, but didn't relate to in such a very distinct way until, mm -hmm. until March of 2020. So of course, if I take that to a bigger level, then as a society, we're also all aware of those issues in a way that we hadn't been before and relating to them in a very personal way every single day because of the pandemic and also because of all of the other things that were happening during the pandemic whether it was um political uh political happenings or the uprising the black lives matter uprising um you know george floyd happened in the middle of um when i was writing the introduction to the book mm. there was just so much that started to sort of become part of this lens that i was already thinking about um so it felt really important to address that yeah i think what you just said really reminds me of this fact that food is really part of every aspect of our lives and as you were talking i was thinking back to at the very beginning of the pandemic when there was such a flurry at the grocery stores and it was all of these empty you know rows of there was no food i mean there was mm -hmm. there was food but like the food that people would just grab and run with i mean it was it was shocking to see and there's something that you say and i wrote it down because i didn't want to forget it you said this in the intro that two things are certain from covid and the pandemic and um, the impact on the food industry and how we relate to each other that one, we need real lasting change and two, we need each other more than ever. And I think if we can keep those two things in mind and look at it through food and cooking and being in the kitchen, it just makes so much sense to me because food is what sustains us, but so is connection. So is conversation. So is empathy. And so they all, I think just really so beautifully can be interconnected. And what I was struck by 
as I was reading the book is all the stories, all the profiles really, I think, inspire that level of change, that level of empathy, connection, and understanding for one another. Because these women are not only sharing the impact of food on their lives through either the lens of culture or history or what they've learned and how they've grown and experimented in their own creativity, but also how it's grounded them and given them a sense of passion and purpose. And I just think it's, it's interesting how it just all, I don't, there's no question here. I just think it's so interesting how it just all beautifully, you know, is woven together. Yeah. Thank you. And I, that means so much to me that you, um, that that resonated with you. And also, uh, you make such a good point. And, um, I should have said this earlier too, is just that like, you know, when, how do I say this? Our, our stories matter. Mm. Right. And when we, when we don't see ourselves reflected in stories that are in media, in books, in films, then we, we don't know that in the same way. And I think that, um, I think it was, that was so important to me. And I think, you know, in thinking about this book and creating it, um, and then thinking about the extra layer of what we've all been through in the last year, when you get to read someone's story or hear someone's story or, or talk with someone and make that connection, you understand them in a different way. You're listening mm -hmm. and you're asking new questions and there is inherent connection and empathy in built into that interaction. And that is, feels more important right now than ever before. It's always yeah. been important, but it feels especially important right now when um, all of the things that are happening around us are mm -hmm. happening. So um, to me, I actually really do see this whole book because it's kind of a unique format. There are so many different kinds of content and there are so many voices woven into the book. I do see the whole book as sort of like a um, conversation. Mm -hmm. It's not a literal conversation between all of the people, but there is this feeling of this is a conversation happening. And the women that are in this book are at the forefront of so many of the changes that we are seeing unfold in the culinary landscape. Mm -hmm. And those changes inevitably affect so many other parts of our lives, collectively yeah. and individually. Mm -hmm. That's a really beautiful point because I'm a firm believer, and I talk about this all the time on the podcast, we all have a story that's meant to be shared and our voice is meant to be heard. And you say this so beautifully that there's a place for every woman's story and the way in which the book is woven together. It is, you're right, like a conversation because each story, each profile continues to build on each other. And so cooking, I think, is a form of storytelling too. And so is food. Mm, and there are so many beautiful quotes throughout the book. There's one, and I think her name is Do Dominique Crenn. Did I say that right? Mm -hmm. And she says, She's a chef, restaurateur, and author. And she says, I'm not serving a menu. I'm serving a story. I'm serving my soul. And I, I mm -hmm. was so struck by that quote because it goes back to what you were saying. If we can begin to see more stories being shared and someone, you can continue to see yourself in those stories. And that's where um, diversity, inclusion, um, providing a space and a platform for others to come forward and speak and share and, and who they are. And, and I think all of us providing and opening up that space is really important. But as you continue to share your story and share who you are, we resonate, people resonate, you see yourself in it, and it allows you to dream bigger and see what's possible. And I think for a lot of us, it gives you permission, I think, to explore your passion and your creativity and what excites you. And you don't feel, at least what I've experienced and what I've seen is you start to step away from a box, you know, that sometimes you're put in if you see your story in somebody else. So mm -hmm. this is just one of the quotes that are like in this book that I was like, oh, this is so good. Like, it's so beautiful and, and so powerful. Yeah. And there are also so many examples throughout the book. Um, I was thinking while you were talking about two that come to mind. One is um, Yawande Komalafe, who is a Nigerian American uh, food writer and recipe developer in Brooklyn. In her essay, she talks about uh, her first trip back to Nigeria mm. after two decades of being in the States um, and sort of coming to a new understanding of her identity um, and her relationship to her her the, her own food heritage and how uh, at the time it was 2016 it was um, you know there was a, a lot of anti-immigration rhetoric 
um, cycling about all over the country. And um, she sort of embraced that moment and said, you know, I'm not gonna hide who I am and what I know. Um, and she started a, um, a group called My Immigrant Food Story Is that hosts um, pop-up dinners in Brooklyn. I don't, you know, obviously not in this moment, but, yeah. um, you know, I think there is this sense of um, ownership when we, can, when we can own and celebrate our stories. And food is such a natural way of sharing those stories um, and celebrating history and identity. And so, um, yeah, I mean, there are multiple stories that fit into that sort of uh, same realm um, mm -hmm. in the book. Mm -hmm. Who was the first person you interviewed for Why We Cook? I was thinking about that. I think that the first person I interviewed was in 2018, um, Chef Krista Chase. And she, at the time, this was in, uh, in Oakland, uh, at the time she was the chef at Tartine Manufactory in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, and then she, uh, right after I interviewed her, she uh, left that position to start a, uh, co-found a bar in Oakland, a bar, restaurant bar called Friends and Family. Um, and she also is involved in a number of um, sort of activism causes. She did a big fundraiser, um, helped organize a big, a big fundraiser for, um, for Planned Parenthood um, through organizing a bunch of restaurants and chefs in the Bay Area. Um, so she was my first, my first interview and she was, it was, I remember that day, I remember walking up to the cafe and being super nervous because I had, you know, probably three sheets of questions that I had prepared and I didn't, it was just so, I was so new at it then. And I think about the conversations that followed that and how um, just sweet and encouraging and open she was with me and how that just really gave me a lot of confidence to keep asking questions and keep reaching out to people. Mm. Yeah. Whenever you do something brand new for the first time, there's always like some <laughs> nerves and some butterflies. I'll never forget the first time I interviewed um, someone for this podcast. Cause I started off just by interviewing my friends. And the first time it was someone I didn't know. I was so nervous. I had like a list of questions. I only stuck to those questions, but as you get, you know, more practice, I guess, or, you know, you get better at asking people things and you get more comfortable. I'm wondering too, is there a conversation or an interview or a contribution to the book that maybe took you by surprise or didn't go the way that you expected? Um, you know, someone that comes to mind is when I, when I got to talk with Haley Thomas, who is the last uh, profile that I wrote and she's, she's the last person featured in the book. Um, and she is, I think she's 19, she might be 20 now. Hmm. Um, but when I talked to her, I think she was either 18 or 19. Um, and she is just, I mean, she, she didn't, I should have not been surprised because I had read a lot about her, but she just was like such a thrilling, energetic person to talk to who has accomplished so much in such a short amount of time. She's, yeah. um, she was still a teenager when I talked to her and she had been, I think she started at her, a nonprofit it's called happy, um, when she was 12, she was honored by Michelle Obama. Um, she has relocated and expanded her nonprofit. She has extended her work to international speaking. And she, um, I think something that really stuck with me about that conversation is how kind of like what we've been talking about, she really um, put words to this idea that nothing is really separate. Um, that everything, you know, when we have a conversation about food, she's a vegan, uh, a vegan cook and, um, nothing is, you can't take anything apart from anything else. Meaning approaching food is also related to talking about food justice and mm -hmm. where we get food from and the origins of food. And all of that is, um, part of our conversation as a local community, a national community, a global community, and our relationship to the earth and the land. Like it's all part of this unfolding onion of issues. Yeah. And um, 
and talking with her, I don't know, you know, I'm 40. I think that talking with someone who's so young, who's sort of just at the early phase of, of adulthood and really coming into her career and, and all the potential of that, you know, I think I was asking her, um, do you want to go to college? Like she's, she's self-taught. She's just, Mm. you know, she's like very passionate about everything she's doing. I said, is college something that you want to do? And she was like, you know, I don't know if I get there, I'll get there. But in the meantime, I'm really happy about what I'm doing. And, um, and I feel fulfilled and busy and I have so much that I want to do. And I think she was also just talking about, uh, you know, about this idea of intersectionality Mm. and how it relates to everything that she's interested in and that drives her passion um, can be sort of put into that framework. And I think that that, I don't know if it's a generational difference or um, just hearing her talk about it that way. I was, I was so inspired by hearing her talk about, um, about her passion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was struck by that, that um, feature in the book too, because it just goes to show at any age, you can really pursue what excites you and brings you joy and allows you, I think, to express yourself. And what she said, what you touched on, how everything is connected. It just came to mind this analogy of when you are cooking and you're putting all these ingredients together, you can't have the meal without everything together. So everything, this is a terrible analogy and I'm not explaining myself well, but I think you know what I mean. Everything comes together and you need, you know, this thing for the other thing to complement each other or to spice it up a little bit. And, oh, what a, what an interesting woman really. And Um, also, and also how we as people are all connected, whether mm -hmm. we like to believe it or not, our actions and our behaviors impact each other. And I think that that is a big part of her message Mm -hmm. also. I think so too. So I want to talk about a couple of other women that you highlight in the book, if we can. Your illustration of Carla Hall, like I, I was obsessed like I wanted to pull the, I don't know what page it was on. I was trying to pull it before. I'll but show you. It is, it is so, I mean, it captures her personality, I think, in the kitchen. And anyone who's on YouTube, Lindsay's holding it up right now. <laughs> I mean, you interviewed her for the book. I mean, what was that, what was that like sitting it was, down with her? Yeah, it was amazing. Um, she, I, I was starstruck getting to talk mm-hmm. to her. Um, we talked on the phone. Um, she, it was like, talking to someone I had known for my whole life she was just so friendly down to earth Mm -hmm. warm curious genuinely interested in what I was doing um it was incredible and her voice and her spirit even through the phone is exactly how it feels in this illustration like it's Mm -hmm. joyful and uh like a big hug basically like I just felt so um so welcomed by her in our conversation and um and we had a great a great talk Mm. yeah you really captured her beautifully (laughs) and I didn't know that people had cookbook clubs until I read about Gray Chapman could you share Mm -hmm. a little bit about that because I was like okay we need to I need to start a cookbook club in my life because that just sounds so much more fun (laughs) I didn't even know so fun I, no. I was part of a cookbook club in, in California um, until recently before my family moved also. And it was, it's so exciting because people, everyone takes turns picking a book that they want to focus on. And, and then you come together. I mean, obviously it's more complicated in this moment, but I think you could still come together, you know, virtually and trade mm-hmm. food locally. Um, actually that's been something, this is like a little bit of a sidebar, but that's been something that's been really interesting talking to people about how their food and cooking habits have changed Mm -hmm. through the pandemic and how creative people have been about coming up with virtual gatherings and how food is often at the center of even of those virtual gatherings. Mm -hmm. Um, So um, yeah, so Gray Chapman is a writer in Atlanta. And um, I, when I met her, this was, so a lot of the conversations that I had and when I invited people to be part of the book, we sort of had back and forth conversations like trading ideas basically until finally we landed on something. And so I talked to Gray and she said, you know, I'm gonna go think about this. And then she came back a couple of weeks later and she said, well, what do you think about this? I was at my cookbook club the other day and I thought, well, how perfect. Mm-hmm. And there it is. And and she really talks about sort of, not just sort of the, 
uh, the special nature of, of going to the extra effort, if you will, of having a special meal, maybe during a time that you wouldn't normally put that much effort into cooking, but also sort of the solidarity of this group of women that, um, and how the friendships grow through that connection. Um, mm -hmm. So I think her, her essay is really beautiful. Yeah, I think so too. And it kind of reminded me about what Gail Simmons talks about in her essay or her feature in the book about food really being this unifier and like seeing the world through the lens of food. I just pulled it up so that I could, you know, make sure I don't misquote her. But I just thought that was so interesting because it goes back to what you and I have been talking about this whole time that food is really everywhere and it has this beautiful ability to unify us. And so even if we're only you know, seeing one another virtually or digitally, you know, over the last year, it's still so present. And I thought it that is. was really and striking to me. Yeah. And actually talking with Gail was a, another highlight of the research process. Mm -hmm. um, she, talking with her about her experience, she's traveled all over the world, obviously professionally through what she does on TV, but also um, her family that was part of her own family's uh, priorities growing up. She's Canadian and um, her mom uh, was also, is also a writer. Um, and uh, I think that that value for, of hers growing up really shaped her perspective. And she talked so openly about that and how it has continued to sort of unfold through her professional interests and how it's just never ending. Like she travels and she's experienced so much um, obviously, and there's still, it's just this still this never ending quest. There's always more to explore. Yeah, there's always more to explore. And I was really touched by that too. And it, it another quote, because I've been, just been throwing out quotes from this book, <laughs> but it's from Jocelyn Jackson. And she talks about how food is about being about relationships. So I want to read it. It says, for me, food is a prayer and a protest. It is a sacred practice inherited from all my relations. The stories of food inspire empathy and connection, Food is about relationships and survival and creating the future. And Jocelyn is a cook activist, founder of Justice Kitchen and co-founder of People's Kitchen Collective. And I was really struck by that because it's about survival. It's about creating the future. And, and I mean, I'm in a very privileged space. I've never thought about food in that way, about it being about survival, about, you know, food equity and um, making sure there's access to food. And I really was touched by what she said because it's through relationships and it's through compassion and understanding and seeing how we can reform food and what we can mm -hmm. do to come together and really push forward for it that I think it starts with relationships because if we understand mm -hmm. somebody else's experience, um, even just a little bit, if we allow ourselves to step into that space, we understand the need. We understand, okay, what can we do? We look beyond ourselves, which I think now more than ever in the last year, and you and I've talked about this throughout our conversation is just really important. So I was really yeah. struck by her words and it really left a strong impression on me. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. The last um, woman I want to touch on is, um, God, there's so many, but Celia Sack <laughs> talks about cookbooks <laughs> yeah. as an especially important form of storytelling. I was like, tell me more, Celia. Like, this is amazing. I, again, never thought about it that way. Not once. Tell me more, Celia. I feel like that could be <laughs> like the side of a sign on the, on the side of her shop. She's an I think incredible it could be and it should being. be. Yeah. yeah. She's like a walking library. She, um, so Celia Sack is the, um, a founder and owner of Omnivore Books on Food in San Francisco. And she was also one of my first interviews, um, oh, wow. in 2018. She, um, is a extremely knowledgeable, uh, woman who, she started out in rare book in rare books, modern literature, and um, and then she started her this store in two thousand eight, and it's basically just like a cult destination for anyone who um, is trying to track down, you know, like a rare cookbook, a rare edition of um, uh, I don't know Edna Lewis cookbook, mm -hmm. first edition, or the most recent, you know, hot cookbook that's just out. It's the full spectrum and. Her um, her shop ha is is small and cozy and intimate. It's like walking into a jewelry box. There's just like mm. color everywhere, and it's cozy and books on every surface. And um, it's just the kind of place that you want to spend an afternoon mm -hmm. 
um, browsing. I can't wait to visit after yeah. the pandemic. And your portrait of her totally captured that too, which <laughs> I thought was beautiful. So no, that portrait actually was um, in her in her home library. I interviewed her oh, in really? person in her wow. home library. And, um, and her home library is also that way. It's and just it's as fantastic. Sort of like a treasure box. Yeah. <laughs> so she, she showed me, she generously showed me around her home library wow. and told me a lot of great stories. Wow. That's amazing. So I got to ask you this then, what has been your biggest takeaway from all of these interviews and these conversations with these incredible women? What have either your biggest takeaway or, or maybe a lesson that you've learned throughout all of this? I've learned so much. Um, I've learned so much about not just making a book, but also um, what I love about what I do and mm -hmm. why uh, illustration has become this path to collaboration and mm. um, and storytelling that I don't know that I ever really understood in the same way until now in my life and my career. Um, and so there's that part of it, like the mm -hmm. professional part of it that I've learned about myself um, and the creative part. And then in terms of my own relationship to these stories of the bigger picture of the content of the book, I think um, my relationship to cooking has changed so much mm -hmm. by, by getting to know these women in, in this way and um, and having these conversations and really connecting to people through this topic in a way that I have, I hadn't done before. Um, my personal relationships to like these other broader relationships that I got to create through the process of making the book. Mm -hmm. And when I'm in my kitchen now, when I'm cooking, I really truly feel like they are with me. And that mm -hmm. is, that feels like, um, it feels like connection. It feels like meaning in a different way. It feels like solidarity. It, it has given me a lot of purpose in, in cooking. And I hope that it, it does that for other people also. And I hope that, um, that in reading the book, readers uh, expand their own questions, whether it's about other people and the amazing women in the world that are doing this work in not just in this book, but mm -hmm. all of the women outside of this book who are doing this work every single day. Um, I hope it expands people's questions about, about that. And, and I hope it also encourages people to ask more questions about the meaning of food and cooking in their own lives. Mm -hmm. um, so there's just this real inward, outward pull. And I still feel like, I mean, the book has been out for almost a month and I still feel like I have so many more questions. I feel like I could just continue digging into this topic. Um, and I hope I get to do that. Hmm. Thank you for sharing that. That's really beautiful because I know the book, it really offers a lot of, in my opinion, hope for the future. It has so much wisdom contained in it. Empathy, this discussion of equity, I think is really important. And you feature 112 women, but there are still so many more, just like you said. And so I have to ask you, I'm really curious, and this is a question I ask everybody that comes on the podcast, but through this lens, I think of food and cooking too, but what is your biggest dream? And I know it's a loaded question, but I got to ask it. <laughs> oh man. Uh, I mean, making this book has been a total dream come true for me. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe that's kind of like a cheat answer, but um, this was a dream of mine to make and illustrate a book, especially in collaboration with so many talented people. Um, I think my biggest dream would be able to continue to do this work, to be able to do more books like this and more projects that bring me mm -hmm. in touch with so many inspiring people. Um, I think, you know, professionally, that is my dream, but also this project has, um, has sort of crossed into the more personal aspects of my life in a lot of ways. And I also really like that. I mm -hmm. like that. I like that my work isn't separated from the things that I actually care about in my life. And to me, if I'm going to spend time and energy making art or writing, that has to be the way it is. Mm -hmm. It has to be connected. And so if I get to keep doing my life like that, that will be a dream come true. Hmm. 
Hmm. I'm really struck by that because the opportunity, I think, to fuse your passion, your creativity, what excites you, what brings you joy with purpose, with sharing an important message, with highlighting other women and their messages. To me, that feels like a huge honor to be able to do that. And um, I'm really struck by what you said, and you will continue to do it. I have no doubt. <laughs> Lindsay, I have Thank you really, so much. You're so welcome. I have really enjoyed sitting down with you and having this conversation. And um, if everybody listening hasn't, couldn't tell, I've read the book and it's beautiful and <laughs> I'm holding it up again. So everybody on YouTube can take a look. Um, Lindsay, <laughs> where can everybody find you? Connect, buy the book, dive in uh, and uh, learn more. So you can find out more about the book at whywecookbook.com. Um, you can find all of the information about where to buy it and upcoming events um, that are going on. And then you can also follow me on Instagram at, at Lindsay Gardner Art. And that's Lindsay with an A. Perfect. Everything's going to go in the show notes. We'll make it so easy for everyone to connect with you and find the book and buy the book and dive in. And thank you so much again. I mean, this book and your journey really, I think, shines a beautiful spotlight on women in the food industry and the way that food connects us and unifies us and really touches every part of our lives. So Lindsay, thank you so much again for coming on the podcast. Thank this you, was Sydney. a lot of fun. Thank you for inviting me. This was a great conversation. 